Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Eric Turing. I'm the Senior Vice President for the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar. And I will turn it over to Dr. Suzanne Tomasi, who is the Chair of the ACVPM Continuing Education Committee. Suzanne? Hello, everyone, and welcome to our April ACVPM CE webinar. I'd like to welcome Major Haley Haroon White. She is an U.S. Army Veterinary Preventative Medicine Officer with a Bachelor of Science in Animal Sciences and Agricultural Communications from Oklahoma State University and has a Doctorate of Veterinary Medicine from Colorado State University. As a U.S. Army officer, she has served in various roles in the U.S. and overseas as a team leader, cl veterinary clinician, and instructor. She obtained her American College of Veterinary Preventative Medicine board certification in 2019 and is currently pursuing a master's of public health with a concentration in global health and epidemiology at the University of Colorado, Denver. Everyone, I'd like to welcome Dr. Haroon White. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am really excited to talk to all of you today. I have spent the last year and a half or so working on a project with the U.S. Agency for International Development, researching current literature on antimicrobial resistance in livestock and hoping to identify some viable mitigation strategies. So I'm really excited to share what I learned with you today. So for our agenda today, I will give a brief introduction of antimicrobial resistance as a One Health issue briefly review how antimicrobial resistance occurs and spreads. We'll discuss a systems thinking approach to identifying causal drivers of AMR, impacts of AMR on livestock health, food safety, and food security, and then some opportunities to address AMR. So what is antimicrobial resistance? It's a natural survival mechanism that bacteria, viruses, parasites, protozoa, they all use to protect themselves. And we know that antimicrobial drugs are incredibly important for treating and preventing disease. So just not using them is not really an option. But these drugs have been misused by wrong drug, wrong dose, wrong duration, um, and overused, prescribed when not really needed in both veterinary and human medicine for quite some time. And that has accelerated the rate at which microbes are developing new resistance genes. But the true scope of antimicrobial resistance and what makes it really, really scary is that the issue extends far beyond just who did or didn't get antibiotics. Resistant microbes transfer between populations, and they can be found in soil, water, plants, wildlife. The bottom line is that AMR is a quintessential one health issue. And because of these complex relationships, I'm going to use as what we call a systems thinking approach to discuss both the causes and the solutions to AMR. So our discussion true to the One Health concept, it will encompass not just veterinary medicine, but we'll also talk about ecology, conservation, marine biology, geopolitics, humanitarian issues, sustainable development. And at the intersection of all of those areas, we'll examine the effects that antimicrobial resistance has on our big three, livestock health, food safety, and food security. So what is the significance of AMR? No population is safe from the spread of AMR, but developing regions in particular are at high risk because they inherently have high rates of infectious disease that are requiring antimicrobial treatments. There's inequitable access to quality medications and poorly resourced health systems. Zoonotic infectious disease rates are high because of routine close contact with livestock and abundance of insect vectors, contaminated water sources, and poor sanitation. The World Health Organization has designated antimicrobial resistance a top 10 global public health threat. 
A recent Lancet article reported that 1.2 million people died of complications related to AMR in 2019. And that is more than either AIDS or malaria. Projections indicate that without significant intervention, AMR will contribute to 10 million human deaths per year by the year 2050. And the World Bank estimates that 24 million people, mostly from low income regions of the world, are going to be forced into poverty from the economic effects of AMR by 2030. So this is a huge global issue that we are tackling. So how does resistance occur? So we're gonna go back to uh, bacteriology class from vet school for just a little while. I'll try not to get too boring or too into the weeds with you. Um, but remember that there are two primary mechanisms of resistance. We look at intrinsic and extrinsic resistance. Intrinsic resistance is a type of natural resistance that occurs even without exposure to an antimicrobial. Examples include a lack of binding sites for a drug or production of an enzyme that inactivates the antimicrobial. Certain species of Staphylococcus exhibited resistance to penicillin even before that antibiotic was even introduced to human medicine. The primary concern with antimicrobial resistance, the issue that we're talking about today, is extrinsic resistance also known as acquired resistance. Acquired resistance occurs through two primary mechanisms. You can either have mutation to microbial genes or acquisition of external DNA that codes for resistance. The first pathway, genetic mutation, is a survival response to the selection pressure that's applied by the antimicrobial. So microbial populations experience selection pressure when antimicrobial agents are used. They kill the majority of the population. The surviving population adapts and survives by mutating genes to resist the effects of the antimicrobial. So that new smaller resistant population, the next time that same antimicrobial is used, they have the ability to resist it because of that mutated gene. The other pathway, the acquisition of external DNA, is known as horizontal gene transfer, or HGT. This transfer is achieved using what we call mobile genetic elements, or MGEs. That could be things like plasmids, transposons, or integrons. There are small segments of DNA that code for resistance, and they can be shared between bacteria. The transfer of MGEs is the major contributor to multidrug resistance, or MDR, in bacterial populations. Importantly, MGEs can be transferred between unrelated bacterial species. So of these two pathways, horizontal gene transfer is much faster and it's much more dangerous because it leads to rapid spread of AMR to new populations of microbes. It's a major contributor to the spillover events that we're gonna talk about shortly. Of these two pathways, it is much faster, much dangerous, and leads to many new populations of microbes that have resistance but have never even seen that antimicrobial. This diagram is an excellent visual example of how complex the spread of AMR and thus our attempts to stop the spread of AMR can be. Through contact with contaminated soil, water, and food, populations that have never encountered antimicrobials are developing antimicrobial resistance. When we look at factors that contribute to the emergence and spread of AMR in the livestock sector specifically, we can group them into three major areas. We call them the enabling environment, stewardship considerations, and spillover events. The enabling environment is the regulatory and policy infrastructure and can include things like 
a lack of regulations that prohibit or limit the use of growth promotants, the lack of mechanisms to enforce withdrawal times, ability to purchase antibiotics over the counter, presence of a black market that supplies counterfeit medications. All of these are conducive to allowing further spread of AMR. And the reason that we call them the enabling environment is they don't have anything specifically to do with the individual that is getting that antimicrobial, but it sets up the framework of how we allow people, veterinarians, human doctors, pharmacists, farmers to obtain those antimicrobials and then how many limits are put on how they can be used. The next area, stewardship considerations, is probably what most of us would think about when we talk about um, drivers of antimicrobial resistance. This is the who gets the drug, how much, how long. Um, but there's also additional factors to consider in the stewardship considerations. For instance, how many livestock veterinarians work in the area? Because I was working on this project with USAID, we we're mostly focused on developing countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. So when we look at the veterinary infrastructure, in some of these regions, there can be a single veterinarian for an entire region. And so that really doesn't give enough support to the, the cattle farmers, the, the sheep farmers in those areas to have them utilize veterinary services to make these decisions about antimicrobial. And combined with the fact in the section above that they can purchase antimicrobials easily over the counter with no prescription needed, uh, that compounds that issue. Also under stewardship considerations, what infectious diseases are prevalent in the livestock? If we have a high burden of infectious disease, that's gonna push those farmers to want to use antimicrobials more often so that they can maintain the health of their animals. And then strength of educational programs and advisory services. That will serve as a platform to inform livestock producers about the dangers of AMR as well. And then third are the spillover events. Spillover events describe how resistance in one population moves into a new population, mostly due to some kind of contamination. This can include antimicrobial drug residues in meat, which we'll talk about more um, later, often a result of not following withdrawal times or not having established withdrawal times. Um, contamination of meat, so resistant bacteria um, contaminated on the surface of the meat at slaughter. And then contamination of soil and water by manure or human fecal material. This last one is especially an issue in areas where people live in close proximity to livestock and where sanitation systems aren't well developed. And we'll have a vignette that talks about that a little bit later. The first vignette that I want to talk about, which also illustrates these spillover events, um, is about farming salmon in Chile. Chile is the second largest salmon producer in the world after Norway. Chile also uses significantly more antimicrobials in its salmon production than Norway. At 500 grams of antimicrobials per ton of salmon produced. That's compared to Norway's 0.15 grams per ton. Now, why are they using these antimicrobials? Pisces Ketsiosis, say that five times fast, is a fish disease that causes major mortality in farmed salmon. And it's the primary reason why antimicrobials are administered. In salmon farming, the first phase of production is usually in enclosed ponds or sluice troughs on land. And then after that phase of production is over, the immature fish are then transported 
into open pens in the ocean, like you see in this picture. 96% of all the antimicrobials that are administered are administered after the salmon reach the ocean. So essentially what happens is the antimicrobials are mixed in the food that the salmon eat, and they're delivered by basically dumping that food into the water above the pens. And the, the food filters down into the pens, the fish eat some of it, and then the rest of it settles on the ocean floor. An estimated 70 to 80% of all of the antibiotics in this medicated feed are not eaten by the fish. They actually end up in the ocean water. So you can see how difficult it is to contain who receives access and who receives um, this food when you can have free ocean fish come by and eat this medicated food as well. Well, researchers sampled sediments both from aquaculture sites where these salmon are farmed in the ocean and then completely unrelated sites up to eight kilometers away from these salmon pens. And this is in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Chile. And they found that antimicrobial resistance genes were present in the sediment even eight kilometers away in the ocean. And they found resistance to three of the most commonly used antimicrobials, tetracycline, fluorphenicol, and oxalinic acid. And the levels of antimicrobial resistance were not statistically significantly different between the site that was directly underneath a salmon pen and the site that was eight kilometers away. So these high levels of antimicrobial resistance in the marine sediments suggest that dispersion of large amounts of antimicrobials used in the salmon farming has created selective pressure in the marine environment. And passage of antimicrobials into the environment can select for resistant bacteria and increase that horizontal gene transfer and cause that genetic recombination of antimicrobial resistant genes. So the authors of the study concluded that they saw an unimpeded flow of antimicrobial resistance genes between the environment and animal and human bacteria. And that has the potential to introduce antimicrobial resistance of fish resistance into human pathogens, which is really, really scary. So now let's talk about the first impact of AMR, and that's on livestock health. The bottom line is that antimicrobial resistance means a decreased ability to treat priority livestock diseases. For example, USDA, USDA APHIS shows, data shows that in 2020, 22 0.6% of Mannheimia hemolytica isolates from U.S. cattle were multidrug resistant. 51% of strep suis isolates from U.S. swine were resistant to at least one antimicrobial. These are in well-developed countries. We have a high level of regulation surrounding our antimicrobial use, and we are still seeing these high levels of resistance. In Zimbabwe, between 94 and 100 percent of avian pathogenic E. coli isolates, which is the causative agent of cholebacillosis, were resistant to four first-line antimicrobials used to treat that disease. Now, it's not my intention to oversimplify the issue, but at the heart of the problem is that sick livestock means sick humans, and dead livestock means hungry humans. Over 800 pathogens, or 61% of all human infectious diseases, are zoonotic. Primary priority, human pathogens, E. coli, Salmonella, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Campylobacter, those are all zoonotic. 
human salmonella isolates have antimicrobial resistance levels as high as 84%. In Uganda, 93% of human fecal samples and 80% of cattle fecal samples carried multi-drug resistant E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae. Resistance to antiviral treatments for in influenza type A, which we all know is the zoonotic flu commonly transferred between humans, birds, and pigs, has been has found to have been as high as 96%. By 2050, the global demand for animal source protein is projected to increase by 60 to 70%. If we are unable to effectively treat common livestock diseases, we'll have much higher production losses and we'll be nowhere near meeting the world population's need for animal protein. So I'd like to insert another short vignette here to illustrate how interconnected the health of livestock wildlife and humans is. And because of that, how easily antimicrobial resistance can spread. So in 2005, researchers took E. coli samples from humans, livestock, and mountain gorillas living in Buindi Impenetrable, that's hard to say, National Park. This is in Uganda. This national park contains 45% of the world's mountain gorilla population which is only 320 gorillas, by the way. It's really sad. The researchers were interested in examining whether habitat overlap between the gorillas and livestock and gorillas and humans influences the rates and patterns of pathogen transmission between humans and gorillas and whether the livestock might facilitate that transmission. The samples were analyzed to determine genetic similarity and antimicrobial susceptibility. What they found was that gorillas whose habitat overlapped those of humans and livestock at high levels harbored genetically similar E. coli, and those whose habitats didn't overlap had genetically dissimilar E. coli. Okay, we could probably have guessed that. But they also found that 35% of human isolates, 27% of livestock isolates, and 17% of gorilla isolates were clinically resistant to at least one antimicrobial used by the local people, um, including chloramphenicol, streptomycin, TMS, tetracycline, and ampicillin. Now the kicker is, in rural Uganda, antimicrobials for human use can be easily acquired over the counter. Right, this is one of our enabling environment drivers that we talked about in a previous slide, being able to acquire antimicrobials over the counter without any kind of doctor's note or prescription or anything like that. However, antibiotics aren't really used in livestock in rural Uganda. They're just too, too cost prohibitive. And, live, and antibiotics are almost never used in gorillas. So how do the livestock and the gorillas have antimicrobial resistance? Well, the authors speculated that the bacterial transmission resulted from contamination of soil and water. They believed that the humans, by defecating in the forest near where the gorillas range was that they induced this transfer of resistance genes from human microbiome to gorilla and livestock microbiome. And this illustrates the ability of bacterial resistance to easily move between populations in an ecosystem. And the authors concluding their study determined, you know, limiting the transmission of this gastrointestinal bacteria between ecosystems would hugely benefit both human health and the conservation of gorillas who are severely endangered. Just to drive home the ease with which resistance genes can spread between ecosystems, here's a graphic of a conceptual framework for the spread of AMR genes in a poultry, poultry production system. So bacteria in the intestines of chickens develop antimicrobial resistance 
due to selection pressure from stress, overcrowding, and antimicrobial use. Resistance is spread either through contamination of meat with fecal material during slaughter or through poultry waste, which contaminates the environment. Humans are then exposed to the resistant bacteria through eating contaminated poultry meat or through contaminated water and soil. Workers in the poultry production facilities and slaughterhouses can also be directly exposed to the resistant bacteria in the poultry fecal matter during the slaughter as well. So several different ways to get antimicrobial resistance genes just from one single source through the environment to the human population. So that leads us into talking about the food safety impact of AMR, specifically as it is as it relates to animal source proteins, right? That's what we're talking about today is livestock. There are two primary ways that AMR can negatively impact food safety. The first is direct fecal contamination of the meat with resistant bacteria from the slaughtered animal's gut biome. The zoonotic foodborne bacterial pathogens that we're concerned about, things like Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, Staphylococcus. Same ones, goodies, but oldies. The second way AMR can influence food safety is the presence of residual antimicrobials in the meat of these slaughtered animals. So first we'll talk about bacterial contamination. It continues to be a problem in both high income and low income countries. Data from the CDC indicates 20% of all resistant bacterial infections in humans in the US can be traced to eating meat contaminated with resistant bacteria. A recent report from the European Union showed multi-drug resistance, MDR, rates greater than 70% found in salmonella isolates in both human fecal samples and in poultry meat. Campylobacter species showed resistance to ciprofloxacin at rates greater than 80% again, both in human samples and in broiler meat. The causal pathway for AMR spread in this instance is human ingests undercooked meat contaminated with this resistant bacteria, or perhaps they handle the raw meat and cross-contaminate to other food items. The bacteria then either cause an immediate foodborne illness which can't be treated with first or second line antimicrobial drugs, leading to prolonged sickness and possibly the death of that person. Or the resistant bacteria that are ingested don't cause immediate illness, but the resistance genes are incorporated into the gut biome of that person, leading to issues with ineffective medical treatments in the future. And the possibility that that person can spread resistance genes to others through fecal oral contamination. The second way that AMR affects food safety through antibiotic residues is a much bigger problem in low income areas of the developing world, where regulations controlling things like acceptable daily intake, ADI, minimum residue limits, that's M MRL, um, and withdrawal times are either non-existent or poorly enforced. A lack of surveillance and testing capabilities in these areas also makes identifying residue issues much, much more difficult. To illustrate the severity of the issue with antibiotic residues in low and middle income countries, for instance, a study from Uganda found 92.5% of beef contained beta-lactam residues. And a study from Lebanon showed 77.5% of broiler meat had residues from at least one antimicrobial. The causal pathway to harm in this case is that a person eats the meat containing the antibiotic residues. And when those residues come in contact with the gut microbiome, they cause selection pressure which pushes the gut bacteria towards gene mutations. 
Now this person is harboring a population of resistant bacteria in their gut. The other issue is twofold. The anti antibiotic residues could pass through the person's system and be excreted in fecal material and or the person develops resistant gut biome and is now excreting resistant bacteria in their fecal material. Who knew you were gonna talk about human poop today? <laughs> the reason both of these are a serious issue is that you now have a sewage and waste disposal problem. You have a system filled with antibiotic residues and resistant bacteria. In low income areas where waste disposal infrastructure is poorly developed and maintained, this provides another opportunity for contaminated sewage to come in contact with other humans, the water supply, livestock, wildlife, soil, crops. All of these things have the potential to transfer this resistance to yet a new population. So our discussion of AMR impacts on livestock health and food safety lead us to the last impact that we'll talk about today, which is food security. Food security, as defined by the United Nations, is the concept that all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food that meets their dietary needs for a healthy lifestyle. So food insecurity means that people do not have access to safe, nutritious food and they go hungry. At the extreme end of this, you have severe malnutrition, you have childhood wasting and stunting and widespread famine. We already have a huge problem with food security even in the United States, where we have food deserts and we have more than 10.7 million food insecure children. The UN estimates that one in three people worldwide did not have access to adequate food in 2020. The US government's global food security strategy, if any of you are familiar with that, it recognizes that AMR can generate infections or diseases that are more difficult or impossible to treat, and that threatens food production and thus food security through loss of livestock, decreased yields, and diminished economic viability. This issue, unfortunately, is projected to get even worse in the future, and AMR will play a significant role in that problem. The FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, estimates that we will need a 60% increase in food production to feed a world population of 9.3 billion people in 2050. Ideally, we would want that food to be primarily high quality, high nutritional value foods like meat, milk, eggs, in order to reduce the malnutrition rates in these vulnerable populations. But the World Bank is projecting an 11% loss in livestock production due to the effects of AMR. Like we discussed earlier, death of livestock from disease, higher production and treatment costs, lower market values because of poor growth and chronic disease. These livestock losses from AMR coupled with loss of human productivity from resistant diseases is expected to cause a significant drop in GDP, up to $3.4 trillion of world GDP lost per year by 2030. What does this mean for food security? It means that we will not have enough safe, nutritious food to feed our world population. People might not have the funds to buy food, and an even larger portion of the population are going to be malnourished. Considering that the first three UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are supposed to be achieved by 2030, are no poverty, no hunger, and good health and well being, the effects of AMR represent a significant hurdle to this already ambitious goal. So, 
now that I've completely depressed you about how awful AMR is and the damage that it's doing, let's talk about how we can tackle it. First is to increase awareness and inform policies that support appropriate antimicrobial use. The WHO, FAO, and the OIE, World Organization for Animal Health, have each established frameworks to combat AMR. And the first priority on each one of those action plans is to increase awareness and knowledge about how to use antimicrobials appropriately. The AWARE program is a great example of this. AWARE stands for Access Watch Reserve. And it's essentially a huge Excel spreadsheet created by the World Health Organization that separates every possible antimicrobial into three categories of use. The antimicrobials on the access list are first line drugs, and they're supposed to account for 60% of all antimicrobial use. The watch category are second line drugs. They should be used for complex cases or when there's resistance to the first line drugs. And the reserve category are those drugs that should only be used in cases of severe multi-drug resistance. Now, this is a human health tool, but the same concept can also be applied to veterinary antimicrobials because there's a huge overlap in the drugs use in human and veterinary medicine. Another tool is the CIA, not the Central Intelligence Agency, but the Critically Important Antimicrobials List. There's a list for both human medicine and veterinary medicine. The veterinary list was created by the OIE, and it functions essentially the same way as the AWARE list does, but it's just classes of antimicrobials, not every single individual drug. Then the EML, is the essential medicines list, another human tool, but one that can also be applied to veterinary medicine as well. It's a list of all medications, and this is not just antimicrobials, that should be widely available for use in a particular country based on the diseases that are endemic in that area. These three tools are all related to using antimicrobials at the individual level. But we also need policies that inform antimicrobial use practices on a broader scale. The FAO Progressive Management Pathway for Antimicrobial Resistance, that is a mouthful, is one tool that helps countries develop national action plans to combat AMR with a specific emphasis on livestock and the agricultural sector, which has historically received much less attention and funding than the human health side. National action plans are essentially a framework of how they are going to put infrastructure and regulations, policies, funding into place to combat AMR in their country. Second on our list of opportunities to improve animal health infrastructure are it, sorry, of opportunities is to improve animal health infrastructure so that veterinarians, animal health workers, and farmers can make informed decisions on when and how to administer antimicrobials. Expanding access to veterinary services is one way to improve the infrastructure. Like I talked about before, in many low and middle income countries, there might be one veterinarian for an entire region or district, which makes it very difficult to help farmers choose appropriate antibiotics to use on their herds. The idea of task shifting to veterinary paraprofessionals or community animal health workers is a concept that offers the feasible economic opportunities an increase of knowledge on animal disease prevention, provides stable employment, and ultimately improves animal health outcomes. Task shifting is essentially redistribution of primary tasks from a highly trained healthcare professional to one with 
a shorter amount of training and fewer qualifications, but that can provide those essential services in low resource settings. This is actually a concept that was advocated by the WHO um, initially as part of the global response to the AIDS epidemic. The OIE Performance of Veterinary Services Pathway is a program that helps countries develop veterinary capacity, and it specifically recognizes the value of veterinary paraprofessionals as well. Strengthening surveillance and laboratory capacity is incredibly important for early detection of AMR. Surveillance includes everything from zoonotic disease prevalence to res resistant strains of priority pathogens to food safety pathogen testing. If we don't know that the bad bugs are here, we can't fight them. The FAO Atlas program is a program that helps countries identify the gaps in their laboratory capacity and their surveillance systems and creates an action plan to close those gaps. Strengthening agricultural advisory services can help farmers use better management practices to keep their animals free from disease. This might include anything from stocking densities to nutrition to deworming programs. To give an example of this, remember our vignette on the salmon farming? The reason that Norway uses so many fewer antimicrobials than Chile is that they developed a vaccine for rickettsiosis in fish. So they vaccinate all of their fish and as a result need to use many, many fewer antimicrobials. The FAO Global Farmer Field School is a program that offers these advisory services and training to farmers in low-income countries. Then third on our list is reducing the overall need for antimicrobials, just like I talked about with the fish and vaccinations. Additionally, point of care diagnostics to quickly identify diseases combined with effective biosecurity protocols to isolate affected animals will also reduce the need to treat an entire herd or an entire flock with antimicrobials. Another example of a vaccination program that has huge potential is the development of a thermotolerant PPR vaccine, Peste de Petit Ruminant. My French is terrible. In many areas of the developing world, with large populations of sheep and goats, there's no reliable refrigeration that's available to store the vaccines during travel or before administration. So having a vaccine that remains effective, even when exposed to very high ambient temperatures, would be hugely beneficial. There's also some exciting work being done on point of care diagnostics as well. Diagnostics also have the same issues as vaccines. The ability to get a refrigerated sample to a laboratory in a timely manner sometimes just doesn't exist. So the ability to have a test result in the field within minutes or hours of sampling would completely change how we diagnose and treat livestock diseases. And also how we make decisions to administer antibiotics to treat those diseases. An example of a point of care test that has some promise is the LFA, it's the lateral flow assay. It can detect high path AI and provide a result within 15 to 30 minutes. So excited to see where that goes. So I hope the last slide was a little less depressing and gave you a little bit of hope about what we can accomplish in the face of the antimicrobial resistance threat. I'll take a minute here and summarize what we talked about today, and then we can go on to any questions. First, AMR is the result of overuse and misuse of antimicrobials in both human and veterinary medicine. In reality, every time antimicrobials are used is an opportunity for resistance to occur. But antimicrobials are an incredibly important piece of medicine. So our goal is ultimately to optimize our stewardship of them. Second, AMR is a high priority public health and one health issue. It has a global scope, with far-reaching ramifications and affects both 
high income and low income countries. Third, AMR has a significant negative impact on livestock health, food safety, and food security. As AMR spreads, we will be less able to treat common livestock diseases, which will lead to production losses and food insecurity for the populations that depend on that animal source protein. AMR is also a risk to food safety with contamination of meat and antibiotic residues providing a pathway for resistance genes to move between populations. Fourth, long-term consequences of AMR will affect human populations, livestock populations, wildlife ecosystems, all resulting in hunger, poverty, and disease spread. Finally, AMR is, as you've seen, a complex issue. It has no simple solution. It's imperative that we use a multidisciplinary, one health approach to tackle this issue. Areas of opportunity include increasing awareness, policy and regulatory changes, improving animal health and laboratory infrastructure, and reducing the overall need for antimicrobials with novel solutions. I hope that I've impressed upon you the seriousness of antimicrobial resistance, but also given you some encouragement that we can combat this issue. As a side note, just for any of you who are interested, I've linked all the studies and all of the data that I've referenced today at the end of the slideshow. It's, it's in the references slide behind the questions slide. I can take any questions. I really appreciate your time and attention today um, and look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Haroon, Haroon White. Um, uh, we do have several questions that I will go ahead and read those off. So we, we have several good questions here. I, I'll start off with a, a question that um, uh, an attendee posed. And they say, I understand that antimicrobial resistance occurs via the extrinsic and internal mechanisms. How though does overuse precipitate mechanisms of external resistance that we're concerned about? Yeah, great question. So it's essentially a matter of selection pressure, right? If we are using a whopping dose of antimicrobials, that sends a message to that microbial population, and I'm not trying to anthropomorphize my microbes, but um, the idea is it sends a message, we have to protect ourselves, um, we have to survive. And so it induces them to make those genetic mutations even faster, as opposed to if we gave an appropriate dose of antimicrobials to take down that microbial burden and cure that disease, we're not going to kill everything. Something's still going to be left. So that selection pressure would be a little bit less as opposed to an overuse or continued reuse that um, keeps making that selection pressure even higher. I think the next two questions are kind of related to your two vignettes. Um, the first one is regarding the uh, uh, Chilean government and whether they're doing anything about the massive antimicrobial abuse uh, in going into the ocean. And you yeah. mentioned North I'm sorry, you mentioned Norway has figured it out. Are, are other countries doing, doing similar? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, I, I don't know specifically what Chile is doing, um, but there is significant international pressure on them, especially because of these research studies that came out to decrease that antimicrobial use. And really the, the pressure on the salmon industry has been why not use vaccines instead? We already have established the approach in Norway. So why just resort to antimicrobials when, when we could um, use the vaccines as well? But um, I'm sorry, I don't have specifics on what the Chilean government is doing to combat it. I'm gonna share this next uh, comment in the chat session. Uh, Dr. McCluskey uh, posted a article, a link to an article, we're going to, uh, titled A Systemic Review of Enteric Pathogens and Antibiotic Resistant Genes in Outdoor Urban Aerosols. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with that article, uh, Dr. Haroon White. But uh, I am not, but I would be very interested to read it. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And if you had an opinion on finding AMR bacteria in bioaerosols, 
um, and if there was any way to mitigate it. Oh boy, um, I, I definitely haven't done much research on bioaerosols. I think that's really fascinated, fascinating. I'll have to take a, a better look at that. Um, but I imagine that that has to do as well with our sanitation systems and how well we're managing those. Um, so I'll take a look at that article. Okay, um, got about four or five minutes left. If you just want to pick a couple more questions, I mean, there's sure. There's... Yeah, I'm reading um, the anonymous. I don't. I'm not sure who this is from, but are you aware of research that investigates the question of prescribing best practices in terms of dose, high, medium, and low, and duration? Um, I know that several, at least in the United States. Um, Several of the professional organizations, um, the internal medicine comes to mind first, um, have done really good work on trying to update prescribing practices, especially for things like um, respiratory illnesses and UTIs, um, sh showing that we really don't need that 14-day duration in some cases of those antimicrobials, that between a a two to five day duration is actually sufficient. Um, and then also encouraging the use of more of those first line antimicrobials as opposed to complex ones, say using just um, amoxicillin versus amoxiclavionate, um, for example. Um, I don't know if that answers your question specifically, um, but that's what came to mind. Uh, your second question, would you comment on the work or consideration that is being done to characterize the factors that influence prescribing behavior and quantification of this impact? Um, yeah, that's that's a whole topic of itself, I would say, um, and definitely um, a, a considerable issue as well. Um, I, I don't have the capacity probably to, to give you a great answer in, in this forum, um, but definitely if you if you wanna chat offline, I, I can do that. Um, from Josephine, are there instances where drug manufacturers are pushing antimicrobial use for monetary gains? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, how about dumping of drugs and expired drugs into the environment? Yes, um, both of those are, are big concerns as well. Um, I appreciate you bringing them up. Um, those would both fall under, under that um, enabling environment driver, right? Um, how can we incentivize or disincentivize um, these drug manufacturers um, from, from pushing these drugs when, when they don't need to? And also, how can we establish regulations that ensure that these drugs are, are disposed of properly? Um, that is related also to um, the issue with um, substandard and falsified drugs, the black market, um, where the quality of those drugs really can't be determined. And that also leads to big issues with antimicrobial resistance. Um, from Catherine, can you comment on how bans on the use of growth promoting drugs in food production in US and EU countries has had trends on AMR? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So the EU was way ahead of us on this. Um, we were actually lagging behind quite a bit. Um, and so the, our first phase of regulations on growth promotants um, requiring the, um, the veterinary signatures, um, the prescriptions, that helped. Um, it definitely showed a drop. I can't remember the, the percentages right offhand, but I think this um, new regulation that's coming into effect that takes all um, livestock antibiotics off the shelf um, for over-the-counter sale, I think that is also going to um, show a huge drop in the, in the total amount of antimicrobials used as well. Um, Let's go with Dr. Grams. That's an interesting yeah. question. I work um, a good deal in the developing world with some of the poorest and nutritionally at risk. How do you propose regulating antimicrobial use, particularly with the high prevalence of antimicrobials and endoparasitic drugs, as well as antibiotics for diarrheal disease in infants and post weaning pneumonia? Oh, all right. Um, uh, I would say, it, it, depending on the level that you work at, right, 
regu regulations are going to only be achieved at, at the highest national levels. And that's really where the national action plans come in. So if, if the area that you're working in, um, I would definitely look into whether they have established a an action, national action plan on AMR. Um, there's a website that you can go to um, that's um, hosted by the WHO. It's called amrcountryprogress.org. And it will show every single country and, and how far along they are in their progress toward a national action plan and, and funding that and what their strategies are. Okay, and the last question is kind of uh, regarding, uh, you know, if you're aware of where we stand with legislation and or education in our, our country here in the U.S. to minimize the use of antibiotics. Yeah, um, so like I talked about, like the last question um, with the growth promotants, we are moving in that direction to limit the amount of antimicrobials that are used in livestock. And I think that's a, a really great step. Um, we really haven't seen much emphasis um, or much action on the companion animal side, um, which is arguably a, a smaller issue compared to um, the amount of antimicrobials used in livestock and the ability to to transfer the microbes in those populations. Um, but I think that might be another, another area um, to potentially look into is um, mirroring some of the regulations on the human side with the companion animal medicine. Okay. Uh, what body, what regulations? Um, are you, the USDA for the, um, for the livestock growth promotants, the USDA. All right, I think we have kind of exhausted our questions and, and I want to uh, definitely thank you. Um, on a personal note, it was good seeing you again. Uh, haven't, haven't seen you in a couple of years, but uh, definitely uh, great seeing you and a great presentation. And I will turn it back over to Dr. Tomasi. Thank you everyone for attending and staying late. And again, I always want to remind everyone that we're always looking for speakers. Um, so if anybody has a specific topic they would like to hear or a specific speaker or would like to volunteer as a speaker, um, please let us know. Thank you, everyone.